welcome to Curious City, the podcast from Glasgow Life Museums. I'm David Scott and this is how it works. In each episode we head out into Glasgow discovering places and museum objects that link in surprising ways, uncovering the stories that surround us. Who knows where we'll go and what we'll see this time. As our guest this week, we welcome actor, comedian and writer Sanjeev Kohli. Sanjeev, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming along. Before we dive in, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Sanjeev? I'm a radio presenter turned writer turned actor. That's kind of the way that that happened. Um, Originally, I was going to be a doctor, if you want to hear the full story. Did that for four months, hated it. Did a maths degree, which I haven't used either, and I fell into broadcasting, so... Actually, this sort of thing is kind of where I used to earn my bread and butter, radio presenting. Um, And that led to uh, comedy writing because I'd been a massive consumer of comedy as a child, in as much as a very academic child and kind of across the board academically. It turned out my actual education was happened, happened watching the two Ronnies and Kenny Everett, and absolutely. So I became known as a radio presenter who could be funny. And that led to sketch writing, things like Chewing the Fat and Goodness Gracious Me, then led to acting and then eventually still game which is um, probably the thing that um, I'm best known for and I'm happy to be best known for because it seems to be almost universally popular so yeah um, if you just say the guy from the shop from still game people generally know who you're talking about are you spotted a lot when you're out and about in Glasgow it's happened more and more over the years I mean I'd like to think I look very different from Naveed Naveed actually looks like my dad he's kind of based on my dad my dad is a turban Sikh who came to England originally. So he was born in India. Um, my mum was born in Nairobi. They had an arranged marriage. Um, lunch was at 12, dancing was at 3. I always do that joke. And they landed in, uh, in London in 1966, which is where me and my two brothers were born. And uh, my dad retrains a teacher uh, at a teacher training college in Dundee got his first job in Glasgow and that's the reason our family landed in Glasgow you could argue that I'm kind of the epitome of the sort of immigrant experience in the UK and in Scotland you know my mum and dad worked really 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 hard to get us a private school education which I'm eternally grateful for uh, the irony being that I didn't become a doctor I became a comedy writer and actor I'm very very proud of the city I love Glasgow um, I brought my kids up here I'm very much a Ouija and I've absolutely exploited my Ouija-ness in things like Tune the Fat, like Still Game. I mean, you could argue as well that Naveed is almost my Glasgow half and my Asian half coming together in a beautiful point. It was almost like it was written for me and I could showcase that Glaswegian accent, which uh, uh, I apologise to the denizens of Govan Hill for stealing your accent. I didn't steal it, I borrowed it. I'll give it back. It's just a beautiful Glasgow vernacular with that little spin. Just that way of speaking, you know, and I, I, I grew up with people like, they were, the, don't worry, I am brand new, Vidos. Because I think, actually, Glasgow folk don't know how funny they are. Um, so it's been nice to be able to almost tell Glasgow folk, you, you do know you are funny. It's just taken a character like, like Nabi to slightly represent it. It's been written for you, but you're slipping into that. I mean, how, how easy or how difficult was that? I could pretend it was a lot harder than it was, that there was a process, but I knew this guy. Um, Ford and Greg, geniuses that they are, and I have to stress, they write every single word of Still Game, um, all the, every single show, be it the TV or the live shows, and absolute geniuses. And they had the foresight to write this character that was based on a shopkeeper that we all knew. And um, I did worry to start with that what the reaction might be, oh, the highest profile Asian character on television is a shopkeeper, what a stereotype. Well, yes, it is a stereotype, but it's a stereotype because it's true. I've not done the stats, but I would imagine that a disproportionate number of um, of these shops are run by Asian families, not just in Scotland, but all over the UK. And you have to examine the reasons for that. It's because my mum and dad weren't getting jobs. I mean, we had a shop for a while, and my mum was a trained social worker, my dad was a trained teacher. But he watched all of his colleagues get promoted above him, and he had his own theories as to why perhaps a turban seek wasn't getting promotion. So at one point, he thought maybe we should take control of the situation and run our own business. And to me, that speaks of uh, a, an incredible work ethic, but also just a life ethic. I mean, I've always said that if you want to uh, see the kind of Asian immigrant experience encapsulated in a snapshot, go to any private school in Glasgow at pickup time, and there'll be at least one shop van and one restaurant van. And that'll be 
Asian families, Italian families, working their the hookies off to give their kids an education they never had. I mean, the whole education ethic, again, is a stereotype because it's true. We were never not going to go to university, you know. As it turns out, I didn't really use the degree that I got, but, you know, the point was you're going to university and there's no real choice with that. Um, so um, all of these things, I think these are stereotypes that we can celebrate because they're positive ones. Um, so I knew this Naveed character. Just the history of a guy like Naveed, a guy that um, is in a pretty kicked-in area of Glasgow and is the richest guy there. Um, he is the guy driving the tan Mercedes with the private number plate. There's probably going to be a lot of jealousy aimed at this guy. And also, he's probably the only brown face in the neighbourhood, so he will have, have had to put up with a lot of rubbish. And it's only fleetingly referred to in Still Game, which I think is part of the beauty of the writing. A part of the the reason that I was drawn to Naveed in the first place was, yes, he's Asian, yes, he's Muslim, but it's not the first thing that he is. It's the sixth or seventh thing that he is. And it's only latterly that you'll maybe make reference to the fact that he did have a hard time running a shop in Craig Lang. There's a whole thing where an episode called Hyperdales where everyone's going to this big out-of-town version of Costco and he might have to give the shop up. And he had, does this big monologue in The Klansman where he says, I was there for you every day of life, bringing in your roles, and where are you now? You've got the hyperdales. I put up a lot of rubbish. And he just says the word graffiti. It's one single word. And you know exactly what he means by that. He doesn't say racist graffiti, he just says graffiti. But the implication is, I went through a lot growing up as a, a, an Asian man in, in Glasgow in the 70s and the 80s to less, less than the 90s. So I knew exactly who this guy was, so it was a very good fit for me even though he was, you know, theoretically 30 years older than me. I, I knew who this guy was and I knew how to play him. Sanjeev, before we see where we are this week, can I ask, are you someone who likes a museum? Not always. You know that way when you're on holiday and you feel duty-bound to visit a local museum and sometimes you think, this isn't speaking to me. My kids are bored. Museums are meant to be interactive and they're meant to affect you on some level, but this is just dull. And then there are other places like the Kelvin Grove, which um, speak to everyone of all ages, of all backgrounds. So um, I like a museum that likes me back. Opened in 1901, Kelvin Grove holds a very special place in the hearts of visitors from across the city and across the world. It's a classic city museum. It's got a collection that showcases Scottish history, the history of our city, design, medieval arms and armoury, natural history. And it's also the home to one of the finest civic, fine and decorative arts collections in Europe. This place has everything, including a host of wonderful memories for those who grew up coming to Kelvin Grove. Sanjeev, does that sound like you? Were you somebody who grew up coming to Kelvin Grove? Absolutely. When my folks moved up to Glasgow in 1973, we lived round the corner, really, in Hillhead, in flats in Bank Street and Otago Street. My two abiding memories as a child at that time were going to the the swimming baths at the uni and the Stevie building and coming here to the Kelvin Grove. It was just such a lovely thing to be able to do. And I remember being absolutely bamboozled by the height of the ceilings. I mean, it was kind of, kind of scary. It's quite echoey and big and cavernous. But then you very quickly realise kids are allowed. There's things there for kids. There's things there for everyone. It always felt like a very inclusive place, but also just the building itself. It's one of my favourite buildings in the world. It is a city museum. It's a pretty central location and it's massive. You'd come round the corner and there it was. It was almost like a choir of angels would sing as you see this beautiful red stencil building just sitting there like it'd been there since the dawn of time. And yeah, there's just something for everyone. What is it that gives it that sense? I think it's just the range of objects, you know. Um, I'm thinking now of the Elvis, you know, who doesn't love the Elvis? In my day, the dinosaurs, the plane, I mean, it was just that thing of they're trying to speak to people and say, look, art is for everyone, and it just it felt like a home from home. You, whatever age you were, whatever your background was, there was just something for you there. You, you never felt like you weren't allowed to touch anything or, you know, it, it, it just felt like a very welcoming space. So for the episode today, you've chosen a few of your favourite Kelvin Grove highlights. Where would you like to start, Sanjeev? Apologise for being slightly obvious, but I'm going to go for the Dali painting. Very iconic, totemic. I associate it with the late 80s, early 90s. And at that age, I mean, I was sort of late teens, early 20s. Um, and, and I'm not actually massive on visual art, but I mean, everyone knows who Salvador Dali is. I mean, an absolute groundbreaker. 
I love the way they positioned it. You, you had a big, lovely, long walk to it, and you could see that lovely, changing perspective. I think it's done so beautifully. And that sense of height, you almost get a vertigo when you look at it. When you ask most people about Dali, they're going to be probably talking about the surreal stuff and the melting watches and all that. But this was a much more, I guess, conventional work, but still incredibly impactful. Christ of St John of the Cross is the formal title. Painted in 1951, it was brought to Glasgow in 1952. But it's not just Glaswegians who love this painting. In fact, it's out on loan again right now. Alan met with our European art curator to find out more. My name's Pippa stevenson Sit, and I'm the curator of European art for Glasgow Museums. And within my remit, that includes paintings, drawings and works on paper and sculpture that date from around 1450 up to 1960. And the reason why it's 1960 is because the latest painting that I deal with is, is this painting itself, Dali, Christ of St John of the Cross. So you're absolutely the right person to speak to about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one, of my, one of my big favourites, this painting. So the Dali has been chosen by Sanjeev. He's told us it's one of his favourite objects in Calvin Grove. Could you describe the painting itself, please? Sure. Well, it is an absolutely remarkable picture, particularly when you know the work of Salvador Dali and you're used to seeing things like the, the clocks and the eggs and the spindly-legged elephants, etc. And then the way we've positioned the picture is that you go into a small room, it has a room to itself, and what you're seeing before you is an image of the crucified Christ on the cross. But what's so different about this picture is that while we're used to seeing images of crucified Christ with bloodied hands, a gash down the side of him, a crown of thorns, this Christ is absolutely perfect. He's got a perfect muscular body. He's suspended. We can't see his face at all. And the usual attributes or things that we associate with the crucifix are completely gone. And then furthermore, at the bottom of the painting, we can see a landscape, which is quite a distinctive seaside landscape. And it forms a kind of an optical illusion because although we're looking down on the Christ, we're also looking straight across at this landscape. So what you're presented with is quite perplexing and incredibly memorable. Why did Glasgow Life Museums choose that particular painting? Well, this picture has a really interesting history behind it. So when it was made in 1951, Dali was starting this new phase in his career called nuclear mysticism, and this is where he tried to fuse science with religion. And our director at the time, uh, Dr. T.J. Honeyman, was very interested in Dali and the work that he was doing. And so he was invited to a gallery in London to see the work, and this was in late 1951, so just a, a few short months after it was painted. And he went to see the picture, and it just left a real impression on Honeyman and indeed the whole room. There were many pictures by Dali on display at the time in this particular exhibition but everyone wanted to know what was going on with this picture and Honeyman recognised the interest that this picture was causing and so it was really through his dedication and interest in the picture and him recognising what a, a fascinating picture this would be art historically and just aesthetically that that's why his personal momentum, he pushed it through and despite protests, indeed it was, it was purchased at the price of just over £8,000 which was seen as wildly extravagant at the time and it led to protests by the Glasgow School of Art. People were writing in the newspapers for months on end. It proved to be a very prudent and very important purchase. What do you think makes it so popular with people? As curator responsible for the picture, I do get quite a few emails and comments. I think people are just really firstly struck by the skill behind the, the way that Dali has painted this. But secondly, I think that people are often very moved by this picture and they don't expect to be, whether or not that's because they think they know Dali and then they see this picture. But for some reason or another, people often find themselves sat in front of this picture for half an hour, an hour, and they just keep coming back to it. It has this kind of magical appearance to people. Visitors to Kelvin Grove sometimes are disappointed because there's a space where the painting is hung. I was just wondering why we loan it, why we share it with the world. Glaswegians quite rightly feel a great attachment to this picture. It is one of our most treasured objects in the entire Glasgow Museum's collection and I know people do travel quite far to see it and it can be disappointing when it's not on the walls but I think what we also have to understand is that we have a responsibility when we care for these objects that not just people from or visiting Glasgow can see them and indeed 
Dali spoke quite passionately about the world having the chance to see his painting so he was quite adamant that we should show this picture around the world and I think that not only does it allow people who might not have the chance to visit us here to see the, the painting but it also puts it in a greater context so for example with this picture an entire exhibition is being devoted entirely to our picture and that includes archival content that has never been seen before and it also brings with it great academic work. A whole book has been published by the Dali Foundation in line with this exhibition. We will learn a great deal more about this picture as well by affording it the chance to be seen in a different context and indeed the one where it was painted back in Dali's home. Pippa, thanks so much for taking a moment to speak with us Oh, that's today. been a pleasure. Thank you. OK, we've stepped into Kelvin Grove's East Court and we're surrounded by sculptures. We're in Kelvin Grove's Expression Wing. This space is a gateway into the building's painting galleries. High above us is Expression, written large. Known as the Floating Heads, hovering above us are dozens of larger-than-life, white-sculpted floating heads, and they're all pulling different faces. Sanjeev, what do these heads say and mean to you? Well, I'll always associate these heads with my kids. Like whenever we came here, we, that was the first thing we'd go to see. And again, it just speaks about the accessibility of the place because you can't not love them. I mean, you know, when you talk about what art does, it's about the human condition. What better expression of the human condition than how we express ourselves facially? You always hear that beautiful sound of children laughing when you're around the, the, the floating heads. It's, I think it's hard not to smile when you see the the floating head. Absolutely, you're right. Bryony was here earlier in a week to hear a little bit more about the story behind the heads. Hi Adam, could you just introduce yourself and say what you do here at Kelvin Grove? Hi there, my name's Adam Kennedy. I am one of the duty managers at Kelvin Grove and I deal with the day-to-day operations of the building. So we're here to talk about the floating heads as they're often known in the expression gallery. So first of all, what do the heads mean? So the heads were specially designed for us during our major refurbishment in 2003 to 2006 as a way to balance the Spitfire aeroplane display in the West Court. The heads are intended to imitate the freedom of visitors' thoughts and ideas drifting from the orchestrion at the centre of the expression court into the perimeter galleries above. The idea for the heads was the brainchild of Sophie Cave, a visual designer. She designed all of our refurbished displays. Um, I have a quote from her here as well. Here we go. Um, She says, we needed a visual wow to match the west side. It had to fill the space, be visible and exciting from 360 degrees and draw the visitor's eye up so that they become aware of the upper floor galleries. It's an unconventional and playful solution and the public will love it or hate it. There were only four expressions created, but when viewed en masse and at different angles, they appear like so many more. The expressions are repeatedly represented throughout the installation and 110 in total were produced. However, we'll keep secret how many are actually on display up there. That's something we like to ask visitors to guess. And how do visitors react to the heads? Do they like them? Like quite a lot of things in this building, when you see visitors coming in here for the first time, whichever galleries they're going into, often the reaction is to look up and you see that wow in their face. With the heads specifically, a lot of young families come to view them. You usually see parents pointing at the heads, asking their children what expressions they see. So there's quite often cheerful reactions to them, I would say. It's when you talk to visitors and you explain that they're not necessarily an accessioned object artwork. They're part of the design that came with the refurbishment of Kelvin Grove and they realise it's more of an interior design. I would say sort of the purists, if you like, maybe don't have such a positive reaction to them. I suppose there's no reason really why, what difference does it make if it's an object as opposed to, as you say, interior design? The thing itself is still, it is what it is. Yeah, that's right. And I think become iconic themselves. A a lot of the questions we have, you know, when people come through the door, one of the the questions is, where are the heads? You know, that is something that people come to see maybe sometimes more than the wonderful artwork that we have. And you said people ask to see the heads. Um, Is there anything else people ask about them in particular? Yeah, a lot of the time people ask, well, the main one being, how many are there? We usually flip that around and ask the visitor how many they think there are. We don't necessarily have an official answer. I've counted them myself and I came up with 94, and I think that's the official answer. We know that there was 110 made in total, but not all are on display. 
but we quite like to keep that bit of a mystery and invite the visitor to come and count them themselves. How many do people guess? People usually think there's over a hundred, I would say. Okay, I mean, keep it an official secret. You think it's 94? The one other thing I'll say is what we also ask visitors is uh, how many expressions do you think there are? And they'll usually come up with a number like 12 or 16. There's actually only four expressions altogether. Yeah, I had that same experience myself. I thought they were all different, which kind of seems ridiculous now I think about it. They can't all be completely different expressions. But yeah, then someone told me, oh, it's four. And then when I looked at it, I could see that, but it wasn't wasn't obvious. One of the other things that I like to point out, although it's not an actual design feature of the heads, if you stand directly underneath them and look up, They look like flying pigs, and I always love pointing that out to visitors and seeing the the reactions that you get. Quite often there's just this look of confusion, and then that's followed by a giggle. (laughs) Okay, this week we're all about Kelvin Grove Museum and Art Gallery. Let's take a quick look back at where we've been so far. We started off talking about this much-loved museum itself. Next, we talked about Salvador Dali and his iconic Christ of St John of the Cross painting, before heading into the East Court and getting expressive with some floating heads. For our last piece this week, we're staying with expression. Sanjeev, you've chosen Glasgow Museum's annual art competition as our final item this week. Is this something you entered as a child? Yeah, in my memory, um, I think I entered it twice. I must have been somewhere between the ages of 8 and 12. A couple of the best days of my life, actually. The idea was was that... um, you'd get uh, picked from your class at school and you would come to Kelvin Grove and just pick something to draw. And it was always one of my favourite days of the year. I mean, the thing was, I wasn't a particularly good drawer. I think I was probably fourth or fifth fifth best in my class, but it's quite a big drop from fourth to fifth. Also, the idea that you'd be mixing with kids from other schools was lovely. And there was generally a girl I would fancy as well from Fernhill or whatever. It kind of summed up the the ethos of the museum which is kids are welcome to think that a museum would actually open its doors to the schools of Glasgow but that tells you the story of, of the Kelvin Grove it's, and in my, in my memory I think I came twice and I think both times I picked wildlife I think I picked like a, a beaver and some the second time I picked some kind of bird and it was just a lovely lovely morning because I was a very academic kid and that felt like a real day away from that in one of my favourite buildings in the world. Running for 120 years, our annual art competition is open to all children aged 3 to 18. Let's catch up with Michael and Carolyn to find out more. My name's Carolyn Foran and I'm the museum's education officer and my role is to oversee our our programmes and projects for schools and nurseries and college groups. Carolyn, can you tell us a bit about the Glasgow Museum's annual art competition? Yes, the art competition has been running since 1904. The competition remains the same as it did back then. It's about young people coming into the museum to paint or draw things on display. It's open to children aged 3 to 18 years old and they can take part either through their school group or they can take part in their own time as well. And really the main aim of the competition is to encourage young people to visit museums but also to enhance their drawing skills through giving interesting things to inspire them, things that they wouldn't get to see every day and things that they might not have in class to draw. That sounds brilliant. And what type of artwork do we receive? People draw a wide range of different things on display, but things that are always popular include the animals, sculpture. Natural history collections feature quite a lot. Most of the drawings are done by pencil or by pastel and cranes, but we do get some who come and paint and that's great because it's really exciting to see someone who's brought along paints to the gallery and and drawn and painted in situ. And can you tell me a bit about the judging process for the competition? So we sort out all the artworks into age categories and lay them all out and then our judges come in usually around about the first week in June to pick their their, their favourites or the drawings that have caught their eye. In terms of the judges, we usually have a contemporary artist. We also sometimes have curators or people involved in learning or museum education. We've had some quite well-known names. For example, the artist Stephen Campbell was a judge in previous years. 
So we've had a whole host of different people coming along. And recently, for the past two years, we've been trying to re-establish the partnership with the Glasgow School of Art, who were involved right at the onset of the competition back in 1904. So for the past two years, we've had a judge from the Glasgow School of Art as part of our judging panel. So they are then tasked with a very difficult process of choosing, um, within each age category, bronze, silver and gold medal winners. And they also select runners-up in the forms of commended and highly commended as well. And in terms of your time working on the project, is there any memorable moments that stick out to you? I think memorable moments tend to be things like we had a judge recently in about 2017, Marion Gardine, and it was a nice story because we invited her as a judge because she is an artist and also has always been a strong supporter of museum learning. But Marion, it turns out, and I didn't know it when I approached her to be a judge, had actually won herself in the 1960s as a child. She'd taken part and won a bronze medal. She then went on to pursue a career in art and in teaching, and then as a teacher brought her children into the museum, her pupils, and some of them won medals, and there she was, full circle, coming back and being a judge. So it really is something that people really remember taking part in, and even more so if they've won. So I think what's special for me is hearing these stories for people when they're older, when they're coming back to me and they're saying, oh, I remember taking part, or I remember what I drew, or I won a medal and I've still got it. And actually quite a few of our winners have gone on to pursue careers in the arts. You know, it really does inspire and encourage young people to go on and pursue arts, either as a profession or just as a hobby. It's great to hear about it being a real platform for people as well, that's fantastic. It's a wee bit different from other competitions where you can just draw it home and send it in. And also it's different because so much of what that age group, especially the teenagers are consuming is is digital imagery and digital media. So it's quite nice to come in and just take your time and slow down and look at something on display, really look in depth at something and then do a detailed drawing of it. And the teachers say the children are never quieter than they are when they take part in the competition. So they seem to be quite engrossed in their work. So many people would want to see their artwork displayed in Kelvin Grove along such like, you know, prestigious work. It must be such a buzz for the people that get their work displayed. Yeah, even just at the prize given when they come along to get their medals, you can see they're really proud. They usually have um, friends or family along with them. And we really make it quite a special affair, the prize given. It's quite a... It's held in Kelvin Grove Centre Hall. We have the judges back along to present the medals, as well as the Friends of Glasgow Museums who fund the competition. They come along and help with the medal ceremony as well. Uh, and then the works go on display in Kelvin Grove Museum. And I do joke to them and I say, you know, there's plenty of well-known artists out there that would love to have their works on display. So it's really something for them. And we try to make them look good. We want their, their artworks to be properly displayed. It's been really nice learning a bit more about the the competition. Carolyn, thank you. That's it for this episode of Curious City. Huge thanks to Sanjeev Kohli for being my curious guest this week. It's been a real pleasure. I will sing from the rooftops, literally if you'll let me, uh, about this place. It's very, very close to my heart and I think it's an absolute jewel in Glasgow Crown. We've been in Kelvin Grove this week sharing our love for this special place. We talked Salvador Dali, got expressive with some floating heads and closed up with our annual art competition. In our next episode, we'll be hearing a little bit of this. See you next time on Curious City.